word. I thank you that you are alive. I thank you that you move and that you breathe and that you don't leave us to our own destructive uh, devices, but instead, Holy Spirit, you move us. You move us to seek you, and I praise you for that. I praise you for the life you have given to us. I praise you for the freedom that you have given to us. And now, Lord, as we turn to your word, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would breathe life into it for all of us, Lord Jesus. I ask Holy Spirit, that you do the main application. I ask, Lord, that as we work, that you would show our hearts what you're calling forth. And that, Lord, we would begin to take confidence in what you've done. And we would begin to honor you truly as the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. Lord Jesus, I thank you. And we bless you this night. May this word truly be the out-breath of God. In Jesus we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. I love it when, they, when the congregation says amen to that. You know, I think it was kind of a shock to me to find out in Scripture nobody said, and everybody said, you know, that's not in the book. And I have preached in some places where they're not used to interacting, and they didn't say anything. They just said, <coughs> everyone said, <coughs> and I was the only amen. So I really appreciate the interacting. All right, you have Ephesians 2, New King James Version, in your bulletin. Uh, you're free to open your own Bible to that. Um, if it doesn't happen to be the New King James, that's okay too. Um, I wanted you to be able to see exactly what I'm working from. And uh, during this, this fall season, I'm working with the book of Ephesians. And last time we took chapter 1. And tonight we're going to at least do part of chapter 2. I don't know how much we will do. It will depend upon how far we go. All right. Ephesians 2. It was in your bulletin. It's right there. So you can look at it and make it easy. Now, in chapter 1, if you have your Bibles and you open them to Ephesians, in chapter 1, we covered quite a bit of data, and there's only one element of that that I wanted to revisit in verse number 3, Paul is talking to these people. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. I know many say places. Some even say realms um, in Christ. The places in my Bible is um, in italics, just to let me know it's not there in the Greek. Anytime you find something in italics, it's implied, but it's not actually a part of the Greek wordage. Now, as we're working with this, he says that he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now, we worked last time with a visual, and I'm just going to work with it again for a moment. I realize this is transparent, but you can see a red and if you can imagine a sphere, a round sphere, because the word places or realms, sphere is implied. Now, God reveals to us how he thinks. And if you wonder how he thinks, just take a look at what he created. And there's a whole bunch of spheres out there. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the earth shows forth his handiwork. Day unto day at her speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. And there's no speech or anything, but they get the point. Now that's right out of Psalm 19. But it tells us that indeed the, the earth is a sphere. And we know that. It's a sphere. God works. His, his, his thinking is cyclical. And we, we won't take time to explain all that. Isaiah 55 outlines it. But as we work with this sphere, I've colored this one red because this is the earth. This is where the blood of Jesus was shed. On this one, we have a way of relating. That way of relating is our five senses. Our seeing, our hearing, our tasting, our touching, our smelling. We get along in this world with our five senses. Agreed? All right. Now. When it says that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, it's not talking about this sphere. It's obvious it's talking about in the sphere of the spirit, which I've colored blue. 
sort of. I couldn't find the ones I made last week, so we hurriedly made one. All right, but it gets you the idea. It's, it's like heaven sphere. It's like what you see up there, and this is, this is the blue sphere. Now, I made the statement last time we were together, and it's something that, that you can remember very easily, is when you accepted Christ and he came inside of you, when the Holy Spirit came in to live, you did not gain 10 pounds. That's because the Holy Spirit does not need space. We dwell in a space. The Holy Spirit dwells in your space. I, I don't know why the Spirit is content to live in my space, but he is. I mean, I'm talking in my space. You know, inside me, inside you. So when we accepted Christ, the spheres became synonymous. Now, what I mean by that is this. When you were not born again, you could get AM radio. In your internal, all you could do is hear your own sound or the sound of somebody else or the enemy sound. Amen? But once you've accepted Christ and he's coming to your heart and the Holy Spirit is within, now you can get FM. Now you can hear God. Whoa. Mm. You're just sitting there. Somebody's not jumping. You understand what I just said? All of a sudden, you've got an entirely differing thing available to you. It's just not strength and power to exist here. It is the heavenlies. He's given you all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. In the spirit realm is where that is. And it is concentric with your being. Now, you're going to understand this even more. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked or lived according to the course of this world or the ways of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. Now, we're all familiar with that. We've all been there. We've all done that. And he says, that's what all of you were, among whom we also all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. That was our placement. Without Christ, that's just the way it is. Now then, the next two words are precious. But God. <laughs> but God, who is rich in what? Mercy. 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 Mercy is giving you what you certainly do not deserve. My first encounter with a recognition that I had been giving mercy was in a college algebra class. Now, some of you have heard this before, but I was taking my college algebra requirement. I'd had two high school algebra courses. Algebra wasn't a hassle. I went to the final exam. There were six formulas that took a front and a back to work it out. And so I went back the next time. This was my final. This was, you know, and, and we had one more class where he would uh, work with us. And I went to that class, and he passed the papers back to us. And there my paper was with a big, beautiful A on it. Well, now what you need to know is I've never made an A in any math nothing. They don't ask me to add or subtract or multiply or divide. The Lord brings others to do that for me. Thank you, Jesus. And this was long before they would let you have a thing that you could push and get the right answer. So I had an A, and that was just, I mean, I was, I was ecstatic. So I turned my page to look and see if he'd made any notes, and he certainly had. Every solitary answer was wrong. And I thought, he's made a mistake. I failed this test. So I went back, and it happened to be in a Christian college. I took it back up, and I said, Brother Higgins. He said, yes, Iris. I said, you gave me an A. He said, yes, I did. And I said, but I got every answer wrong. He said, yes, you did. And I looked at him like, he said, look at where your answer is wrong. 
and in each case, it was where you put what you put numbers in for the letters. As long as it was A, B, C, D, and F, he says your algebra is perfect. Your arithmetic stinks. <laughs> Will you promise me never to take another college math course? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> and he gave me a B in that course. That was mercy. I did not deserve that. I had worked very, very hard and my algebra was perfect. But that doesn't mean the answer's right. That's mercy. God gives us mercy. In spite of all of our getting the formulas right, our answers usually are wrong. Have you noticed? Mercy. But now, God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, I read all of that just to get it all in the paragraph, and I want you to go back up and look at something. Notice, verse 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us to live together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up together and made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now we're on a journey tonight. I know you have probably read those before, but I want you to take a look at the reality of what it says. When we say Christ ascended and is now seated, where is he seated? At the right hand of God. This passage says, when he was raised, who else was raised? We were raised. When he was seated, which means the work is finished, who else was seated? We are. That means, as I walk in this, I am seated at the right hand of the majesty on high here. I'm seated with him. In heavenly places. You're seated with him. In heavenly places. Now this. Is not theory. This is truth. And it needs to begin to shape. Everything we do as believers. We usually work such. Legalism. In the matter of being with the Lord or getting with the Lord. And the Lord always honors us because he honors his people. I've been wrong most of my life. And he honors me. He always has. The tapes and everything I did 20 years ago, I just pray they burn somewhere. I know, I know, I know. But you understand, I'm on a journey, and that journey is continuing to unfold right out of the pages of this book. And I have been made very, very aware in his mercy, in his love, and in his grace that we don't pray from the position of the throne. Now, we're just going to work with prayer tonight. It should have ramifications in every aspect of our life when we understand we're not poor worms anymore. We're not trying to get to God. We accepted Christ. He came inside. He lives in me. It's hard to get any closer than that. Isn't it? Is, that, is this in the word? When I start counting on the fact that he's in me. When I start counting on the fact that everything he did is a done deal on my behalf. Because I said yes to Jesus. So did you. And it's by faith. I choose to trust Jesus. Now, in the old covenant, in the old tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, God had Moses make 
and, the, and the, the men of Israel make a nice size box of acacia wood. Acacia wood, by the way, is, is a wood from that area of the world, and it's called the, the healing wood. You put a nail in it, you pull the nail out, you go back in two weeks, there's no hole. It self-heals. Symbolic of us, our body self-heals. The Lord is our healer, and we know medicine sometimes helps, but the body, if the body doesn't heal, it doesn't heal. You understand what I've said? So the acacia wood was then overlaid inside and out with pure gold. Then there was a mercy seat. We don't know how, what it weighed, but it was pure gold. And it was placed on top of it. But within that box, within that Ark of the Covenant, was the tablets of stone that God had written for Moses. It was the rod of Aaron that budded, that gave his authority from God, showed the men that he has authority from God. And there was a golden jar of manna saying to the people of Israel, I've got gotcha. you. No matter what, I've got gotcha. you. Your manna will always be there. Your food will always be there. You'll always work with the authority of the kingdom. And you will always have the law of God. Jeremiah 31 prophesied Hebrews 8 and 10 recorded it as having been done. When you accept Jesus as your Lord, the law of the Lord was written on your mind and in your heart. It's a part of the new covenant. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have to study. That doesn't mean. But it means that you've got the capability with Jesus inside to begin to grasp the eternity on the insides of these pages. It's absolutely awesome. It is beyond anything you've ever dreamed. It is the truth of God. You have the ability to grab it. Now, that doesn't mean I understand everything in here. It will tax me the rest of my life. And then when I go to glory, I will discover more. But I'm saying is we need, to, we need to stop regarding this book as something I can't grab. With the Holy Spirit inside, he has written his law on my heart and in my mind, just like the Ark of the Covenant. He has promised me never to leave me and never to forsake me. Isn't that right? He has promised me that, that I can walk in the authority of using Jesus' name. Is that right? Yeah. All right. Then he is, then, so what's left? What's left? We got the authority of the name of God. We've got the we've got the golden jar of manna. We've got everything supplied in the name of Jesus. He's saying to us that we have become the Ark of the Covenant. When Jesus came inside of us, didn't he say you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? We are the temple now. We are the Ark of the Covenant. Now seated on the throne in the spirit and the spirit life. These spheres are simply a membrane away. When someone prophesies, their mind goes from this sphere into that area, sees, beholds, and speaks. That's what the prophetic is. When, when someone is healed, someone goes through that membrane of spirit and moves into the healing and brings it to act upon this. So as we walk in God, we need to understand I am seated with my Jesus as a part of him at the right hand of God. When I pray and I say, Heavenly Father, all I do is turn left because I'm at the right hand, right? Walk with me. I turn left and say, Father God. He turns right and he says, Jesus. Because I'm a part of his body. <whistles> That's our heritage. You can't get any closer than that, can you? Oh, Jesus, I know you hear me. Oh, Jesus, I know you hear me. Father, I know you're moving mountains on my benefit right now. I may not be able to feel them. I may not be able to see them. But I know you're doing it because that's what your word says. And I'm seated here right at the right hand of the Father with you. There's not another hoop I need to drop through, jump through. I just need to receive. I receive fully, and then I will be empowered to walk obediently. It's not that our obedience isn't necessary. Of course it is. But to be, have the power to walk in obedience, we've got to accept these things. 
Now, since we are the Ark of the Covenant, do you realize that when you have, let me just dream a little bit. If Psalm 19 ministries, and you notice it was a big if, we're not here yet, trust me. If we had a million or two million or even five million dollars in the bank, there are some things we would do. Right now, they remain dim visions, but there's some things we would do. And I wouldn't second guess my visions because I wouldn't say, oh, that can't be you, Lord. I wouldn't look at the bank account and say, well, we can't do that because there would be the millions. What I'm saying to you, if there's millions in the bank, your whole mind changes. If there is a sufficiency, everything about you changes to meet that sufficiency. All it takes is walking with some people who are fairly wealthy. And you discover a whole different way of being. They don't worry about the things that people don't have money worry about. They may still be worrers. They still may be having a journey in that with their Lord. But you understand what I'm saying is that when there is a sufficiency, there is a change in the way you think. It is often said, and I hear people say, oh, if I just won the lottery, I'd be the same person. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> Everything about it would change you because the sufficiency would do it enough. Now, I'm not after going for the lottery. Personally, I think it's dangerous stuff. Don't touch it. But that's me. I'm just saying that you just, if, if we had, if we have sufficiency, then we don't worry about the what ifs. We move on the visions of God. You understand what I'm saying? Now then, if we understood beyond theory that I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places, I'm on the throne, my Father always hears me. Always hears me. <laughs> Always hears me. Because I'm in Jesus. Did you get that? I'm in Jesus. That's what Jesus' name means. I'm in Jesus. Because I'm in Jesus, my Lord always hears me. And therefore, I need to pray another direction. A change in, in, in the, the, uh, this. A different perspective. Do you know what you're looking at in that picture? Oh, what'd you say? New York, State. New York State. Oh, yes, it is. But we've never seen it from this perspective unless you've been in the space shuttle. <laughs> that was where it came from. It was on the web from the space shuttle. Onondaga Lake is a little bitty doodad back up here. But you know, you can see the Hudson River, you can see Long, Long Island, you can see that, you can see Lake Ontario, you can see the Mohawk Valley, the Adirondacks, the Catskills, you can see it all, it's right there, but we don't usually see it. That's why we're calling this, this, this whole thing a different perspective. Because if I'm seated at the right hand of God, according to this passage, if I'm seated in Christ at the right hand of God, then my perspective in talking to the Father has got to be vastly different than if I'm just trying to get him to hear me. Good. If I'm assured, number one, of him in me, if I'm assured of his sufficiency, if I'm assured that I have the authority that he's given me, if I'm assured of the things of God, then I talk to the Father very differently. Most of my thanksgiving comes really free now. Because that's mainly what I get to do. Oh, thank you, Lord. I know you're working that out. I have four children, three sons and a daughter. And I haven't a clue what all they need. And thankfully, the Lord doesn't show me. Some things mothers don't need to know. But one thing I do know, my God's working on every last one of them, bringing them into dimensions of himself that they've not even dreamed are there yet because I'm seated in the right hand of God and I'm looking through his glasses and I'm seeing good stuff. That means when I relate to my children, 
even if everything isn't 100% the way I would like it. I've got four children. That tells you something. You know, the more children you have, the more opportunity you have for blessing. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And so we pray not to change them. That's his job. You know, they're all in their 40s. Heaven forbid if mama knows what they need. She has no idea. But their God does. And he knows right where they are, and he knows right what he's doing, and he knows right what is needed, and he's sufficient. All he needs from me is, thank you, Father, you're handling my children. He told me one time, all your children will serve me. Do they? I've got two in the ministry, and I've got two we're praying with. And we bless God for all four because they all four serve him. That's what he told me. You understand what I'm saying? When the Lord tells you something, you take what he told you and you run with it. And that is in this blue. This is where when he speaks to something, it's usually here. That's why when you went to him all burdened with your problem and you waited for him to talk to you about it, when he talked to you, he didn't talk to you about it. Did you ever notice? You go burdened in prayer. We get burdened. We go burdened in prayer. And you lay it all down before him. And you just really expect your God to come around you and give you some instructions about it. And lo and behold, he talks about something else. If you do that, if you do interchange in your prayer, if it's not all just uh, Santa Claus, do this, do this, do this. If you're listening to your Lord, he's talking to you. At least he's trying. But he's not necessarily talking to you about the things you want to talk about. He's your best friend. He's the Lord of your life. And he wants to talk to you about something on his heart. Not necessarily something on your heart. The whole world doesn't exist around you. But it does exist around him. So on the right hand of the Father, we begin to wake up to the fact that I have a Lord. That yes, he's, he's very concerned with me. He's concerned with every moment of my life. He has given me breath all of these years. He is continuing. He still continues to give me visions, and I get to give them to the younger ones to say, whoa, this is coming, so come on. Come on, come on. He doesn't let me get old. We're not doing that. My brother has a saying, and he's my older brother. He says, I have to get older if I keep living, but I will not get old. I will dream dreams and have visions until the day he takes me home. So come on, don't get old. Let's go. Doesn't matter about my age. Every time the Lord has asked me to found something, I reminded him how old I was. He doesn't really care. I've just been amazed at that. It's just amazing to me that he just keeps moving. But he wants to talk with me about things that concern him, his heart, his life, his way of thinking, his way of doing. He wants to interact with me on the words that he's already spoken. He wants to liberate me from the narcissist of belly button gazing. The narcissistic ability to think of myself all the time. You know, when you gaze at your belly button, you really are a pretty selfish person. You don't want to have to do that. You want to be free of that self-focus th where you don't think about anybody but me. And when I start thinking about my God, when I take hold of the fact, hey, I'm seated at the right hand of God. I'm, <laughs> I'm an heir to this throne. I'm an heir to this world. So says Second, First Corinthians 2, I believe. I'm an heir to this world. I'm an heir to my life. I'm an heir to his throne. I'm a co-heir with Jesus Christ of everything exists. And now at the right hand of the majesty on high, it is my joy to begin to think his thoughts, to begin to see his world from his perspective. New York State from a different perspective. I believe it is in... 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul says, we regard no man according to the flesh. We once looked at Jesus that way, but no more. Now we regard all men according to the Spirit of God. That's because he was seated at the right hand of God. 
he was looking through a different lens. It was the God lens. It was a lens that lifted his eyes out of the concerns that I have, knowing that God has already heard my concerns. He's already moving on it. He's already healing. He's already prospering. He's already given visions. He's already going further than I could ever go. He's, all, he's got me in his hand. He'll never leave me. I can move forward with him. He's doing all of this. It's already in motion. I lay down and I trust him with it. And now I say, all right, Jesus, show me. What do you need me to see? And prayer becomes an absolute exciting adventure that we begin to live in the spirit out of. We begin to see the word in a different way. And when there's something in the word we don't quite get, it doesn't bother us because we know that generally we don't quite get a lot. But in his mercy and in his goodness, he leads us. And we're able then to first of all minister to his heart. Listen as a friend to him. Be excited about the things that he wants to share with us. To get over the edge about dumping our burdens and living without a care. Knowing he is sufficient. He's worth more than the millions of dollars. He's worth more than anything we could ever bring to the table. But he brings himself. And he says, now Iris, I just ask you to trust me. You're seated here with me by my action 2,000 years before you were born. You said yes to me, and it was done. And now you're sitting on the right hand of the Father with me. Now, let's talk about things that I can show you. Now, think about it for a moment. If you were used to talking with Jesus, not just about what you need, or what your children need, or what other people might need, And for me, not just what Psalm 19 might need or what the local churches might need that I see or whatever, that that would be literally, Lord, you know, I thank you for showing me this. And I lay the burden of it down. And I choose to be your friend. I choose to interface with you, Lord Jesus. You've placed me here at the right hand of the majesty on high. And I choose to relate there in my mind. I choose to relate there in my emotions. And I choose to relate there in my heart. I choose to relate primarily to you. Because you've chosen to relate primarily to me. When it said God so loved the world that he gave. And this passage here says he had because of his great love with which he loved us. The measure of God's love for each one of us. It's over the top. I tell people sometimes when Jesus died on the cross for you, he overpaid. He overpaid for me too. He doesn't do anything little. And when he gave you forgiveness, he didn't just give you a little thimbleful and hope you could make it. He forgave you. When he gave you grace, he didn't give you just, you know, a little taste of it. He poured it on you like Niagara Falls. He lavished it upon you, the favor of God on your life. And now he calls. And he calls every one of us. It's not just because I teach the word that this call is on me. This call is on me because I am to teach it. Because it is to be what we begin as the body of Christ began to to act. Access is a good word. That's a good computer word. (laughs) I access certain programs. Well, this is an access that is heaven itself. And he has granted it to us. He has seated us with him. Forgiven us. Graced us. Empowered us. And then promised that he would be there for every occasion. Now, let me suggest something to you. You know, and we did this a little bit last time, in this dimension, we walk by sight, right? In this dimension, how do we walk? By faith. What I've been talking about is faith. If you believe the word of God, then this word told us we have been raised and we have been seated. We are seated with him in the heavenlies. Now, just think what it would be when we begin to worship. If we worship from the standpoint, we're already there. When we began to pray, Father, thank you for 
thinking of me and thank you for answering all my prayers. I have a few more. But I thank you ahead of time because I know you've already heard them and you were working on them long before I knew to pray them. So, Lord, I just lay down in trust for you because I know you're doing a good work and I know you're going to lead me and guide me. And let's just go from there and make prayer time the most exciting, the most alive time. And there's no way you can stay quiet in it. I'll be going along in my daily work and just doing it. And all of a sudden I'll just, oh, Jesus, that was good. I mean, something came across, and I had no idea of thinking about that. And all of a sudden, I understood some, oh, Jesus, that was good. He is good, and he loves you, and he includes you, and he wants you to understand your inclusion. Now, just think about it. As we begin to work, all these things we're learning about what God has done and what Christ has done, and all the finished work of Christ and the love and the grace and the redemption and all that it has given to us. And that as we began to access that and we began to pray that way. <sighs> intercession is no longer a burden. It's an absolute delight. Oh, Jesus, I, I want to talk to you about so and so. And he'll just he'll just put the love that he has for them in you. And all of a sudden you can interrelate along that love and you know everything's going to be all right with him. You don't know how or why. But it's not a burden to intercede when you're interceding from the throne's point of view. Everything that we've termed a burden becomes a joy in the throne scene. And that's not to deny there aren't some heavy things in our lives. That's not to deny, deny that there are not some problem areas that we have to work with. But if we approach them from the standpoint of what Christ has already done, it breeds faith in our hearts because that's what the word is. The word brings faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you read that over and you take this passage, just that one paragraph in, in Ephesians 2 and begin, I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly. I have already died. I'm already resurrected. I don't have to fear death anymore. I don't have to fear anything. I'm sitting with God on his throne. And he's regarding me as the woman or the man I am. Years ago, I was teaching Bible and I had taught and I had encountered some difficulty not with my teaching or anything but with with some friends the treatment was not nice and when I got home no one was home it was before my husband retired and uh, the kids were all in away and um, I went to my study and I buried my hands in my head and went down on my knees, just, just put my head in my office chair, and I just began to weep. And, uh, you know, you can kind of tell when the Lord wants some sort of movement after you get used to talking with him. And I didn't know then what I know now, but I all of a sudden knew that my prayers were not really, whoa, something was up. And so I stopped crying, and I just looked up, because I didn't know anywhere else to look, and said, what? Because I knew that this crying and my pain was not moving God. And he said, I want you to stand up. Okay. I stood up. And he said, now, Iris, talk to me as an adult, not as a child not as a wounded child. Now I know we come to the Father as little children. That's the attitude of our heart. But he desires a church that will stand beside him, not cower. A church that will agree, you're seated and I'm seated with you. A church that's willing to take the hard knocks if they have to, to proclaim his glory and his goodness. A church that knows they're seated and are blessing everyone that comes their way because they have the power to. They're not worrying about their next meal because they serve a God who's already put the golden jar of manna in them. A church that has believed his word and is more into loving and blessing and giving grace than into criticalness and cutting and putting down. 
A church that understands they were made one by the Spirit of God and there is no other unity that's acceptable. The mind of man never makes unity. It makes a mess. Have you noticed? I'm using that generically. Not male and female, but all of us. We make messes. But we're one because when Jesus prayed, Lord, that they would be one in John 17, when he poured down the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, that prayer was answered. We are one. And the more we know it and bless one another, the better off we will be. No one put down and no one lifted up, but Jesus. His name is Jesus, the God who saves. Yahshua, the God who saves. And he has done all of this work. And he did all of it for you. And he did all of it for me. And he says, Iris, now I want you to stand up. I want you to stop crying over being hurt like a little child. And I want you to stand up and move in healing and blessing. It was not easy. I was used to being a wimp. And when you're a woman, sometimes that comes in handy. I was used to being timid. Not allowed. Because there's a story to be told, and it's a story of a magnificent king who loves magnificently. And he has done everything that is necessary for every human being to come to him and to accept him and to become all that he is in them and to live the life that he leads to live and to proclaim the magnificent joy of his love and his grace and his fullness, to sit at the right hand of the Father, not to exist as worms, but to exist as sons and daughters of the Most High God, literally taking everywhere our feet tread because we are a people of a kingdom, a kingdom not of this world, but a kingdom of this one. And in him we live, and we move, and we have our being. Father, I thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, I thank you for breathing tonight, and Lord Jesus, for challenging me and my brothers and my sisters. Father, we are yours. And we will to be those who stand and those who stand for your love and your blessing and your grace. Those who willingly pick up and be obedient because it is the way of peace and it is the way of joy and it is the way of proclaiming what we see in the heavenly places. Lord, open our eyes that we may perceive way beyond what we have been used to perceiving. Open our hearts and our minds that we can grow with anticipation of the glory that you have yet to show us. Glories we long to look upon and glories you long to show us. Father, we are yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Do you want to do another song for us? We'd love it. <laughs>